In this video, we're going to be covering part two of our series on Netlify and specifically focusing on things that you should know about building and the continuous deployment aspect of Netlify. So let's drill into that a little bit more. We're going to cover build tools and static site generators. We'll cover what build settings are, what the build bot is, build stages, the different things that are done during the build, what concurrent builds are and how you can cancel builds to keep under your concurrent limit, some build gotchas that people commonly run into, as well as what to, th what to do when things go wrong. We'll end with a discussion about environment variables and the things that you can do to set them in Netlify to change the deployment environment to exactly what you need. First, let's have a little discussion about Netlify and build tools. Netlify is strongly supportive of build tools. In fact, one of the founding theses of Netlify is that static site generators are the next big thing. And that basically came from tracking the statistics on static site generators and seeing that people wanted to use them to deploy to our CDN, but they were manually doing it. And we wanted to build in a continuous deployment tool to help them build and deploy their sites. In fact, I strongly recommend watching this talk by Netlify CEO Matt Billman because it really explains the benefits of the Jamstack compared to what came before it. But anyway, we're here to learn about the build process. So the first thing to understand about the build process is that you can always do local builds. You may not need continuous deployment. Uh, the problem with continuous deployment is that it's done remotely it's on someone else's server, and it may introduce extra hurdles for you when you're actually trying to just develop a new feature. So if you're doing local development, don't use continuous deployment. Uh, just local, locally build and push stuff to Netlify until you're happy that you can turn continuous deployment back on. Let's take our existing site that we've been working on from part one and let's add a build process to it. So right now I have this folder, which is a dist folder, and it's got a bunch of index.html files. And let's say I wanna add some JavaScript to it to write some interactive component. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to add the, bar the parcel bundler. So that would be yarn. First I have to initiate, initialize the package.json. Um, and then I have to add the parcel bundler. And while that's going on, I can also install React, React DOM, because I'm going to use that as well. So here we're not using a static site generator, but we're using, using a build process, and uh, the static site generator is just a massive build process. So now we've got the dependencies installed. We're going to rearrange this a little bit. So I'm going to take this this folder and rename it to source. And we're going to build from the source to the disk folder. And remember that the, the, folder, the folder that we ultimately publish is the disk folder. All right. The next thing I'm going to try and do is I'm going to go to this source folder. I'm going to add a new folder called index.js, for example. I'm going to paste in some pre-prepared React code. And I'm going to go to index.html and add a script like that ID equals app and then I'm going to add a script tag at the bottom saying script source so now when I run yarn parcel source index.html I get a nice local server where I can see the results of my code. It says hello from React, and I can actually click an interactive button. So I know that I've added some JavaScript to my static site. So this is wonderful news, um, and we need to actually make this run in production. So I'm going to cancel my running process. I'm going to go over to package.json and make life a little bit easier for me with some npm scripts. This is obviously optional, but it's pretty common to set this up because it's easy to run. So I'm going to put in my command again, source index.html. 
and I'm going to introduce a build command as well. So this just has a build command. Again, you can use any process. You don't even have to use a JavaScript uh, build tool, but this is just an illustrative idea to bring you through the top thought process. So now when I run yarn build, it's going to execute this command and run parcel build, and that builds to the dist folder. And remember that dist folder is exactly what we're going to ship to Netlify. To verify that a dist folder has built successfully, I can use serve dist. Serve is a CLI that you can install, and that serves the files locally. And you can see that your, your code is running in production. The difference between this old version and this one is that this is running React in development mode. And over here, we're running React in production mode. So that's how you can tell that your builds are running locally. So as long as you can develop and build locally, you may not need continuous deployment because as long as you're debugging things and making sure that your, your JavaScript code is even valid, uh, this is a perfectly fine way and you don't have to use Netlify at all. But what Netlify does for you is starts to do that automation step. So basically, the idea is that you would not be checking in your dist folder. You would just be saying, you would just be adding that to git ignore, actually. <clears throat> and you'd only have the source folder in your code. Let's see what happens when we push our latest changes to git. We can see that our build has failed because this time we don't have a disk directory anymore. Remember, we added that to git ignore because we're now building from our source directory. That means that we need to run the build command in our deployment environment to set up continuous deployment. So that brings us to build settings. Really, there's only two places to set your build command. The first is in your deploy settings. So let's edit our settings over here and add the build command yarn run build. And we're still going to deploy from dist. And we'll save that. You can use the base directory if you have a subfolder, uh, for example, if you have a mono repo set up. So now we have the build command set. We're going to have to go back to deploys and rerun the deploy again. You can see that our build is now successful. And in particular, you can see that we're now executing the user command yarn run build, which is the one that we did. And it's showing us running the build, showing the output of the build, and then saving a bunch of dependencies, and then deploying site from dist. So over here, if you want to check out the deploy, you can open this in a new tab and check out how this React code is now in production on the production Netlify site. And it's using the production build of React. So that's all well and good, but there's a second way to set build command, and that's in netlify.toml. This is a higher priority command, so it actually overrides what we had before. So I'm going to comment it out, and this is how it should look. Under the build settings, you should add a command equals, and then whatever string you want to run yarn build. So this can take any form. Uh, previously, we set yarn run build, but uh, if you're using yarn, you can also just type yarn build, and that is basically the same command. I just want to show you some visual difference. I'm going to commit it to git, add build command, and I'm going to push it to master. And that'll kick off the build again in Netlify. Notice that this time, there's a special message printed over here saying there's a different build command detected going to use the one specified in the toml file, yarn build versus yarn run build. So yarn run build is the first command that we set in the user interface. And yarn build is the second command that we actually set in Netlify.toml. So this is higher precedence because that's the single source of truth for all the Netlify settings that you ever want to build. So I personally encourage people to use Netlify.toml, but you may find it easier to onboard beginners with uh, the web UI. Either way, when you read your logs, you should be able to figure out what's going on by keeping an eye out for the commands that you want to run and looking for any error messages in case. 
So overall, that's a very gentle introduction to build settings. It wasn't too hard. But really, what's at operation over here is the core of Netlify, which is the build bot. And that's something that we're going to dive into a little bit in this next section. So one way to find out about the build bot is to read some of these documentation on the site. It goes into a little bit about the origin of the build bot, some default environment settings and versions that you may want to know about. But basically, the high-level concept that you should know is that the build bot is basically a Docker container. Our CTO used to work at Docker, and so we're very familiar with this, this technology. And it gives us a lot of nice security and reproduction capabilities that is very helpful in creating a continuous deployment service like Netlify. So let's check out what the Docker container environment looks like. It really is just a massive bash file. This is entirely open source, so you can actually run it locally, so you can debug your own Docker builds. There's different versions of the build images that are available. So the legacy sites will have the trusty version. You should not run into that if you're watching this video. And the current sites have the Xenio build image, and that's uh, the more current up-to-date version. You can see the branches accordingly. There is ongoing work on new, a new version of the build bot. So by the time you watch this video, there may be a new version available, but hopefully I'll also have a new video out by then covering that. But basically, you should be aware of that you can actually pull down the production, the exact same Docker image that Nullify runs to your local environment so that you can test your builds in case something is going wrong in, in this whole build logic. And it's also open source, so you're welcome to contribute. But again, I want to stick to the high level. If you know that there's a build bot, you know that you can reproduce it, you know that it does a number of different things, but at a high level, you should be aware that there is a cache. So Netlify builds are not entirely stateless. They actually, we actually cache things for performance improvements. Everything is stored in a Netlify cache directory. And in fact, you, can, you personally can use a build script to save things in cache, diff them, and decide whether to build things or not based on the cache. You may write your own scripts, or you can use open source tooling like this one from David Wells called Cache Me Outside, which is pretty clever. I do like the name a lot, but basically it helps to think about helps you to think about checking where do you store things in cache, how should you handle a cache update and then checking for diffs between updates. And if there is a need to update the cache, then you run the cache update again. Um, so a simple thing like that can actually cut down your build times by a lot by skipping the steps of building things that are unnecessary for you to build. Then it will install, then a build bot goes to the second stage. It starts installing dependencies. The dependencies here are not just your, you know, pack npm dependencies, but also your node versions. It will check uh, the .nvm versions, for example. It will check your Ruby environments if you're using a, a Ruby static site generator like Jekyll, PHP, Hugo, so on and so forth. It even has Python, Go, uh, a, a nice grab bag of everything that you could possibly want. I even have had some success installing Haskell. Uh, you can just curl your various environments and store them in cache. Um, basically anything that you can do in a typical bash environment, you can do in Netlify. Um, then we get to the actual build process. That's where we run your build command, if you have one. Obviously, we did the first part of the video entirely without a build process, so you don't have to have one if you don't need it. Then we package and optimize. This is an optimization step that uh, may or may not apply for you, but basically this is post-processing and other optimizations that we do for delivering to our CDN. Then we're going to deploy the site from uh, the disk folder. Again, this is from the folder that you specified in your netlify.toml or somewhere else. Um, we're going to save the dependencies for the next build, and we're going to output a manifest. You can't see over here, but there's a manifest of what has been produced 
so that we can do diffs and so that we can produce images, uh, so that we can produce summary information like this, showing you what files and what redirect rules have, have changed and have been processed by the build bot. So that's the long, that's the high level overview of the build stages. Things happen in a sequence and I think if you know the, where your issues are, if you're debugging a build, um, it will help you, it will help us a lot in helping you and all around demystify Netlify by a lot. So the last thing that we should cover before getting into the gotcha section is concurrent builds and canceling builds. So the idea here is that anything can trigger a build, right? I can be pushing a commit to Git, or I could be triggering a deploy over here, or I could be triggering a deploy from a build hook that we talked about in the previous video. So over here, I have a build hook that I can just be calling randomly. And so there, now I have two concurrent deploys. So what's happening right here is that I only have a maximum of one concurrent deploy. So this is building and this is waiting. Sometimes I actually want to just skip this step because I just want to go straight to the most recent build because I know that's the one. And so I can just click, on, click in here and cancel the deploy. So once I cancel the deploy, I'm no longer I'm using that concurrent deploy. And now I have the next one in queued. So I just have to wait a little bit, but already it's starting to build. So that's the, that's the rough idea. If you want to have, for a, one, for a single person workflow, one concurrent build is probably enough. But you may want, for a team, you may want to look into multiple concurrent builds so that you don't hold each other up. Canceling the build is as simple as just killing the Docker process. And that's, and that's all of it. So as long as nothing, so as long as everything is failing, every single build is failing, the most recent successful build actually st still keeps alive. So, so your site doesn't go down until we have a new successful build. All right, so time to cover some gotchas that people typically run into. In fact, this is probably the most difficult part of learning Netlify, which is learning how to use a continuous deployment environment. In fact, we have a whole place in the docs dedicated to build gotchas. So if you have any issues, just make sure to have a read of all of these and see if that matches your situation. So some of the common gotchas that I wanted to highlight is, first of all, the 15 minute rule. Basically, if your build takes longer than 15 minutes, Netlify might cut it off on the free tier. If you're a customer or you have some sort of special case, you may get in touch with support to extend it up to 60 minutes or higher. Um, Next, you also have to think about permissions and API secrets. Sometimes your builds, particularly if you're using a Gatsby or Nuxt template that requires a API key, otherwise it will fail to build, then you may need to provide those API keys in order to build, build stuff. We'll have a section at the end about environment variables and where you can set them. Lastly, I also want you to be careful about what folder you're deploying. So make sure that when you have a disk folder, you're, you're actually building to the disk folder. Sometimes people just aren't aware of what folder they're deploying to, and just thinking of that through can help a lot. And of course, there's a community Netlify topic where you can find out a lot more about FAQs that people run into on building things. So that really leads me into the troubleshooting part of the video, basically what to do when things go wrong. Make sure to read your build logs. I've already read uh, the build logs with you for a number of different build situations. Make sure that you can build locally. So if all else fails, at least make sure you can do your build command locally, like yarn build, for example, and make sure that runs without any hiccups so that this exact same thing can actually run in Netlify. And then also think about hidden dependencies. So for example, over here, I'm using node 10.13. And over in Netlify, I'm using 10.16. If there's any if, if there's any differences that I'm relying on, that might actually cause some very subtle bugs. So just to be aware of that. You can set the node versions in an NVM script, and it's all well documented in the docs. Next a yarn versus npm issue. So for example, one of the very common issues is 
relying on yarn in your build command, but then not having yarn in your build environment. And yarn is only installed if you have a yarn lock file. So if I delete this, this will just run, this will just assume it's an NPM setup and the yarn command will not be available. So you'd need to add a yarn lock file for the yarn CLI to be installed. And that's just a pretty common issue for beginners. Uh, basically, just always commit your lock file. If you're using Hugo, Grunt, Bower, or any other environment like Ruby or Python, definitely head to the build settings page to check out options for configuring the versions of your environment so that you can run the version that you actually expect. And if all else fails, definitely check out community.netlify.com where you can probably search your question to be answered or just file your own question. The last part of this video focuses on environment variables where you can set API secrets and all other good stuff. So basically the only place to set environment variables as of right now is inside the user interface. So let's head over to our site, go to deploy settings, scroll all the way down to environment and set environment variables. My secret, for example, I'm always angry. So I'm going to save that. And now I can access this environment variable inside my build process. So I'm going to go in here and actually try to add that to my build process. One way I can do that is to just add it as a build command, as a pre-build. So over here, I can just add pre-build. And by the way, this is a built-in feature of NPM scripts, nothing Netlify specific here. And let's commit this. So now if we open up our Netlify log again, you can now see that inside our new build, we're running the pre-build script. And it echoes the secret that I've placed inside of my environment variable. So this is handy for open source projects that may want to ping a private API for example, to get some data to actually pass into the static site generator so you can build, for example, a Shopify site or Airtable data or anything else like that. Netlify environment variables are not just for passing in secrets to your app. You can also use them to change the environment, to vary the environment. So you can check out this list where these are Netlify specific environment variables, Netlify communicating to you so you can check, for example, process.env.netlify, and if that's true, then you're inside of a Netlify environment. Netlify also tells you what immutable URL you're deploying to, the main URL that you're probably going to access, what branch is coming from if you're deploying from a different branch, the commit, the build ID, the context, basically a lot of metadata to figure out what the origin and meta, and meta information about your build is. So that's the first category of environment variables, which are things that Netlify puts in your environment to communicate to you what is going on in your environment. And the next category are things that you can set inside of Netlify's environment. So that changes the versions. For example, you can set the NPM version, you can set the Yarn version, or your Ruby version, or your Go version, or your Java version, or Python version, um, and all that stuff. And so this is extremely variable, and it's all there for you if you need it. There are also another category of environment variables that you should probably never touch, but these are helpful in case you need them for some debugging or some magic internal advanced things I personally never use. So if you want to learn more, check out this Scotch article that I wrote detailing how to use environment variables to pass secrets to the front end. Take note that exposing API tokens to your front end is sometimes a bad thing. So React, Vue, Gatsby, they all like to make you prefix your environment variables to make sure that you're aware not to leak everything over. Um, and then a simple guide as to how to change environment variables to vary your environment, like we already explained, as well as some other power user features that we talked briefly about. Yeah, so that's an overall guide to Netlify build. In aggregate, it's not too complex, but when you combine building with deploying to Netlify Edge, that can be extremely powerful. And in the next video, we'll cover local dev and what Netlify can do for you there. See ya.